¿Sí? Instagram belongs with my son's name, but he's so proficient on Snapchat. 
Um, Oliver's 13. He's fine.
going to um, hand it over to, to John now, who is going to uh, welcome you formally from Council and introduce you on our speech for the evening. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Jill. Um, and this is amazing. Who would have thought 10 years ago, in other words, 10 years ago, looking into the future, that we would be having a meeting about active ageing and our MC is not here, but is over there looking nice and being able to talk to us. I don't think any of us would have thought that was possible. Anyway, I am John Palmer and I am the Deputy Mayor. Uh, and the first thing I'd like to do is acknowledge that this land that we live on today is the traditional lands of the Gaurna people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with that country. We also acknowledge the Gaurna people as the traditional custodians of their own region and that their cultural and heritage views are still as important to living Gaurna people today. I, um, oh, and of course, while we have Jill here, um, not being able to attend, Obviously, because I'm standing here, the mayor could attend. And he does have COVID. He <laughs> is uh, probably two hour test on Tuesday. Uh, and he won't be back with us until next Tuesday. Um, so, if I can paraphrase the word that he often uses, I am delighted <laughs> to welcome you here this evening at the, this prestigious town hall to explore the future of ageing. Hunley was the first council city in Australia to be given the age friendly city status and I think, uh, I think they're, very, they're very proud of that um, and uh, what we're doing here tonight is um, part of that process. We are committed to a 10 year active ageing strategy with a range of actions and strategies that are important to the community and as I just said this is one of those actions. We have, as Jill said, an active ageing alliance. And yes, I do attend those meetings as many as I can, um, along with two other councillors, Councillor Bonescu and Councillor Rupert. And I do notice there's a handful of uh, committee members here now. Well done on being here, and well done being on the committee. The first meeting of that alliance, I remember sitting there and we were asked to introduce ourselves. I introduced myself and I then went on to say that I'm getting older. <laughs> People looked at me, I just thought for a minute and said, I'm not getting old, but I am getting older and I was getting older the day I was born. And that paradigm helped me prevent myself from telling me I'm getting old. Once I start telling myself I'm getting old, I may as well hit that trench. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce Stephen Yarwood, our guest speaker. Now I might read from the bio that I've been given. Stephen Yarwood is passionate about cities and innovation. He is a respected urbanist and award-winning member of the Planning Institute of Australia, considered an international thought leader on the future of cities. He helps communities and corporations maximise the relationship between people, technology, infrastructure, society, the economy, environment, and cities. Now, that's the official bio. When I met Stephen, uh, it was in my first term of council here in Wanneroo, the term 2010 to 14. And that period of time, Stephen had the dubious honour of being Lord Mayor of the City of Adelaide. Um, his bio is as impressive as any of you will find. In fact, what I just read out, if you want to know more, jump onto LinkedIn and you've got to scroll down and down and down and down and down to find out what he's done and who he's been involved with. But I must say, as I did that this afternoon, I couldn't find any reference to the time he spent here. Once he, once he uh, relinquished his role as Lord Mayor, he joined our development committee. And I can tell you that what you're in for tonight should be entertaining, should be insightful, and should be challenging. And I apologise on 
this behalf right now if you are challenged. Because I tell you what, what he has to say, you might not want it, but it'll probably be in the future in 10 years' time. Um, from tonight's perspective, he is acknowledged as one of the premier futurologists this country has. He has an uncanny knack of predicting what the future holds for our community and build a future citizen. I also look forward to tonight's session as I plan for the time I have left on this planet. And Jill, um, I've read that a male in Australia today, if they reach 70 years of age, don't say it depends on if I won't tell you how old I am, but you expect to live to 95. So as, as you predict what's going to happen in the future, I hope you go as far as 25 years from now. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much, Don. That was uh, incredibly kind of you, and uh, I've got to say it's uh, an absolute privilege to be here. Um, and yes, uh, well, and uh, the list of things isn't that long, but certainly I might need to add my time here. Uh, and I have very fond memories, uh, and I think he's referring to the fact that I was able to come in after I was an elected member to be an, a specialist, because I'm an urban planner, specialist advisor on the committee, and I just, it was just really delightful to, um, turn up and not have to worry about the politics and being an elected member and actually just speak my mind. So the difference between being a Lord Mayor and a former Lord Mayor um, is I can say, oh, I'll just say whatever the damn hell I want. Uh, I don't want to offend anyone or upset anyone, but you know what I could say uh, there. Um, I too would like to acknowledge we're on the traditional lands of the Ghana people uh, and I often uh, challenge people to think about how they can consciously uh, make a difference to respecting their cultural and spiritual connection to the land. So uh, instead of just acknowledging it, I'd like to, uh, to challenge people to think about it differently. Now, um, I just, someone, I'll, I'll go and put my slides up. Here we go. Just one second. Here we go. We'll get Jilla off the, now, oh, I've just got to go back to the start. There we go. One second. It's always the way, isn't it? Okay. Oh, you know what? I've just done something really strange. This was meant to be my apologies. Right, here we go. Okay. Great. So thank you very much for the very warm welcome. Also, can I specifically thank everyone for attending? Um, you know, we're, we, you know, let's face it, we're not out of COVID yet. People have forgotten about it, uh, but I want to acknowledge that you've come out. It's also the middle of winter. It's pretty cold uh, outside, so uh, thank you. And it's also an incredible privilege to be speaking here at the uh, Town Hall. The other one I'd say is that um, having now worked as a futurist for seven or eight years and I've been working nationally and internationally, uh, Middle East and, and uh, uh, Asia uh, and uh, also New Zealand as well as around Australia. I think this is the first time I've done a public presentation uh, for free to the community in seven years in Adelaide. Um, so it's actually quite special for me and, and a big deal. Um, this is actually also only my third local uh, government client in South Australia in seven years. So I'm finally, finally getting work back here in Adelaide, having worked for uh, most of the big councils around Australia, but um, that's another whole conversation. Okay, so I will kick off, uh, and uh, I just uh, want to have a conversation today, uh, or this evening, about the future of ageing. I'm going to cover a whole range of issues, it's going to be uh, quite diverse, uh, and so we'll, we'll fly straight into it. Um, and a bit of a background here, and this is about time, being a futurist is about time, so yes, I was an urban planner uh, and I did my planning degree uh, back in 1992. Now looking around the room, I can't see anyone over the age of 40, so um, uh, you, you would have all been in nappies at the time. Um, and then of course I was uh, Lord Mayor in 2010 uh, to 2014 uh, and uh, I walked out the door as former Lord Mayor at the ripe old age of 43. Uh, and that's when I got the ability to levitate uh, fruit uh, at the central market. Uh, and of course now uh, I'm a futurist. Uh, without getting into it, long story short, um, many of you would have known of the multifunction polis, the MFP, we've got some nods. I was doing my planning degree when that first kicked off and Adelaide also had a 
2020 vision exercise uh, and I had the privilege as a planning student of being there and I decided um, uh, when I was 21 that I wanted to be a futurist. I spent the next 15, 20 years being told to shut up, sit in a corner, lucky to have a job, just write your reports. Uh, and then I ended up being a research officer in Parliament and there were, I can tell you there was a lot of politicians who were incredibly shocked uh, when I became the Lord Mayor. But I wanted to touch on the, the futurist element. Just out of interest, who's seen a futurist speak? Stick up your hands. Good. I'm glad I've added some slides here then. Uh, because being a futurist isn't necessarily something you do a degree. There's no degree in futurism. Um, it is something that is very much about a calling and a lifestyle. It's a belief system. So science is my uh, belief system. It's not just what I do for a job. It's kind of what I do when I wake up. It's how my brain works all day, every day, and think about things in the evening. And uh, if I could claim watching Star Trek as a tax deduction, I probably would. Um, and also, though, um, it's a very multidisciplinary approach. So town planning or urban planning is very similar. It's about knowing a little bit about a lot, not a lot about a little bit. Um, and so this notion of a polymath, someone who applies different um, uh, issues or different um, uh, thought processes or different areas of knowledge to put them together to create unique problems and, and solve things. And I'm going to encourage you to think about how you could be a polymath when it comes to your future uh, later on. It's also about curiosity, passionate about communication. Carl Sagan's a hero, David Suzuki, um, uh, people who have been able to bring knowledge to the community, and also crazy. Uh, if, as a futurist, I don't say anything absurd tonight, I'm not doing my job right. So I, my, I don't want to offend you, but if I do, that's your problem, not mine. Just joking. Uh, but I do want to challenge you, and, th and that's my role tonight. And so the idea uh, of being a futurist is that I was really concerned, uh, sort of growing up and, and watching as a professional, that most of our cities, states and nations, uh, corporations as well, are run by pale, stale male men in their 50s and 60s who extrapolate the last 10 years of their life to plan a future that will look nothing like they can conceptualise. And, and so for me, I put this photograph up because uh, I, I give the metaphor that um, planning the future by looking at your past is like driving forwards in your car by using your rear vision mirror as you look in the past. And so it's very easy to uh, understand the past. It is very difficult to conceptualise the future. And, uh, and so that's, that's my job. Um, also, just in terms of being a futurist, it's about uh, what uh, we describe as the long now. So uh, most people, especially in local government these days, and I sympathise, are so busy putting out grass fires. They're worried about paying, the, you know, if, if you as individuals paying your bills, um, whether the crows are going to win this weekend, um, etc. So it's all about that short-term thinking. As a futurist, it's about a longer now. And so whether it's a, a longer now, which is a 30-year period, uh, and I've already started to make reference to the 30 year period of getting here, or the long now, which is a lot longer period itself. COVID is a really good example uh, where you can look at the Spanish flu and start to understand the issues. Another really good example is looking at the transition from horse and cart to car. And now we're starting to look at the transition from car ultimately to autonomous vehicle. And so understanding some of those trends and thinking in a longer term, it does stress people out, including my family and um, and, and, and even just having conversations sometimes, because I do kind of think of things in a little bit different um, way. And oh, that went two slides, so there we go. And for example, if you're more of a graphic person, it's the difference between thinking about this and thinking about this and thinking about a longer term. So we're all worried about COVID and recession and jobs, etc. I'm more worried about the rise of machines, when women are going to finally have an equal say in, 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 on the planet, um, and, and also things like biodiversity collapse and, and, and climate change, etc. So it's a different thing. Now, being a futurist is not about telling the lotto numbers. That's been, and I've already been asked that tonight. Um, so the point is, and in terms of predicting, it's really honestly not about predicting the future. Um, it's uh, also not about what's probably going to happen either. Uh, in fact, that's probably the worst thing you could uh, consider. Um, it's more about talking about what's possible. Uh, and, and ultimately, it's about what's preferred. 
And so my job isn't to get up here and tell you what's going to happen. My job is to tell you what's possible and what would be potentially preferred and encourage you to be the change you want to see in the world, encourage you to create the future. It's very easy to get lost in understanding what we can achieve and thinking it's out of our control. Uh, my job is to empower people and you know, whether I'm working with councils or state governments, etc., cetera, or, or you as a community, if we in Adelaide, who are highly educated, wealthy, privileged, uh, organised, uh, if we can't make a positive impact on the world, the whole planet is in big trouble. So it's really important to know that we are the custodians of a, of a future and we've got a responsibility there. And the other element to this is that Let's face it, there's been more, and we, Don's already made reference to this, with Jill um, coming in on, on Zoom. Uh, we've seen more change in the last two years in many ways than we've seen in the last 20. And so we are starting to understand that change can happen, it's not linear, it can be accelerated and we can get outcomes. Uh, and there's a, a conversation around, um, uh, I've heard the term a new normal. I don't really aspire to a new normal, I aspire to a better normal and there's a change with all of this disruption to say, why have we done it this way? Why can't we do it different ways? Uh, and, and things like climate change in particular are things that we really start to need to take some serious um, action on and do some sorts of things. But I'm not here to talk about that. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the future of ageing. Uh, and in fact, uh, you should never start a presentation with some apologies, but I am going to say I'm sorry because there are a couple of things I wanted to touch on firstly. Firstly, I want to acknowledge that everyone is different. People who have come along tonight with an expectation that I'm going to solve their problems or I'm going to talk about how you could do this and you might want to exercise and you might want to do things and you might say, well, my back's stuffed. That's no good to me. And I know the feeling, by the way, my back is stuffed. So I want to acknowledge diversity. There will be people in the room who will think, he didn't mention this, he didn't mention that. So you want to ask me questions. Um, but importantly in that, I've only got another 50 minutes. I can't talk about the future of everything and the future of ageing and squeeze everything in. So I'm going to touch on some key issues. Uh, and the last one is I'm a mere male. And so ageing is different for men. It's different for women. It's different in different countries. Uh, and it's different uh, based on social contexts and, and opportunities, etc. So I do want to acknowledge that it is uh, different. And in particular, for example, women live longer than men uh, and there are a lot of challenges that come with that. And uh, I don't want to stand up here and profess to be an expert on it. I, I'm also going to touch on things I'm not going to talk about. So firstly, um, uh, if you've not heard of it, the term black swan is a term that's used for things you don't know. And I don't know what I don't know, uh, and so I'm not going to talk about alien visitation and how it's going to mean that we'll live, be able to download our consciousness so we can upload it on a machine and put it back into an organically grown prosthetic body and walk uh, distant planets for thousands of years. That's what I want to do when I grow old, Jill. Um, so I'm not going to talk about... Oh, this is uh, your... Uh, Buzz is a little bit sensitive, I'll have to work on that. I'm really not going to touch on climate change, I've mentioned it a couple of times, but it is a very big part of active ageing. It's going to change uh, and challenge how we live our lives, the price of fuel, uh, where we live, how we live, um, the extreme events, experiences we're going to have, but I won't get into that tonight. I'm also not going to try and predict where the economy is going to take active ageing. Anyone want to guess where the stock market's going to go? Uh, at the moment, uh, inflation, interest rates, um, that's not why I'm here. So I won't be touching too much on that. I also am not really going to be talking about the morals, ethics and values. Let's face it, things have changed. Another really good example of the long now and active ageing is, is sexuality. And so, for example, 100 years ago, um, if you were homosexual, it was you know, virtually a death sentence. 50 years ago, you were ostracised and you had a very, very difficult li life. Now we've seen 20,000 marriages over the last five years <coughs> in society. So that's a good example uh, of the long now. And there's going to be a whole pile of changing values um, that we really can't know or predict. And I'm also not going to talk about government policy too much either. Um, but what I would hope is that something that comes out of tonight that you can then harass Don afterwards get council funding and get a whole pile more money for active ageing. And Jill, you so <laughs> I want to cut of that now. Uh, you so owe me for that one. Um, but I'm also um, 
going to, but what I am going to talk about um, is the future citizen, and the future citizen is about understanding demographics. And let's face it, the baby boomers have defined this country, uh, defined urbanism, defined the economy, uh, defined what's popular, what's in, what's not, uh, and that's starting to change. So we're starting to see um, Gen X come through, uh, and Gen X numbers now with the new census are, are nearly as many as, as the baby boomers. Uh, the baby boomers are retiring, uh, and, uh, and so it's about understanding the different changes of the different groups uh, of de demographics. Um, and in particular, ageing is, is incredibly important. So why is ageing important? Well, interestingly enough, 50 seems to be the big number. Uh, you are starting to be in an older category, uh, you're ticking the ageing box or the, the uh, uh, older citizen when you're 50, I'm 51. Um, but interestingly enough, um, between now and 2050, the number of people over the age of 65 in Australia is going to increase by 50%. In fact, globally, it's going to double. It's going to increase by 100%. And I think uh, this um, uh, graph is also... Uh, this is very sensitive. Please work. This graph is also, Jill mentioned life expectancy. Um, not only is the number of older people going to dramatically increase, uh, but we're going to see more people on the planet over the age of 65 in the next couple of decades than have existed in the entire history of humanity. This is something completely unique. We've never experienced it. We don't know what it means, how it's going to work. Uh, and that's going to change a, an incredible amount around uh, our society. And this one I like too, because this is incredibly interesting. The, the, the graph here of the, the, uh, the, the global statistic uh, that we're literally at that pivot point where we're going to have more people over the age of 65 than children under the age of five. So we're starting to see a very strong shift, not only in Australian society, but on the planet in terms of the rise of the ageing society, uh, versus the decline uh, of a youthful uh, society as well. Um, and this is another very good st statistic. It's not hard to get stuff on 2050, uh, with over 2 billion people total worldwide population. So 21% um, uh, of people at least are going to be uh, over the age of um, 65. So that's some context. Now, there are some other really uh, particularly important reasons that you would want to look at ageing. Uh, and that is that this is really about the fastest growing uh, part of the economy. Uh, whether it's in, in Asia and its wellness and its hospitals, um, South Australia is doing particularly well. We interestingly have one of the biggest, we have the biggest medical precinct of any city in Australia here on North Terrace. And so um, there is going to be an incredibly important part of the economy. We've got the South Australian Medical Research Institute, SAMRI, uh, and uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to create jobs, to sustain the economy, uh, and to really start to understand what the growth industry is, what it means, uh, and how we can actually make, uh, put Adelaide uh, on the front foot. We are a, a livable city, and so we can attract people who want lifestyle, and, and ageing in place, and ageing effectively and having all of the right services and being a brand in this space, it's going to be very good for South Australia. Uh, also, uh, there's some very significant consequences for the future of food. How do you feed 10 billion people? Uh, especially with climate change and urbanisation and a whole range of other things. I'll touch on food later, but there are some very significant things we need to understand about the ageing population if we're going to actually provide the right kinds of food. Uh, and of course, water as well. And it has significant implications for cities. I put this up because it's a bit tongue in cheek. I don't think this is the future of cities. These are the sorts of pictures that architects draw when they don't have any work on. Um, but I, I will touch on the future of cities a little bit more and talk to, uh, I think I'm about to completely decimate the city of Unley's development plan. Um, not true. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure I'll be talking to it and supporting it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, most importantly, it's about not sticking your head in the sand, and clearly you're not because you're here, and acknowledging that there is very significant change ahead, uh, and uh, the only certainty in life is change except from a vending machine and that we need to embrace this if we're going to live our best lives um, as well. 
So um, another big part of this that I think I really wanted to sort of start on is that there are some really key issues around um, ageing now that need to be tackled in an ongoing way in the long term. Who's heard of the term ageism? Yep. Now, importantly, it's not just for older people, it's also for younger people, but they deserve it because they're lazy and they just like avocado toast. But, um, I'm joking, um, but this is something that I just really wanted to touch on because I think it's incredibly important. So, right now, ageism is everywhere. One in two people worldwide are ageist against older people. Um, but interestingly enough, we actually um, not only do it to other people, we do it to ourselves. We talk ourselves down, we undermine ourselves. I was having a seniors moment. No, I just, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not perfect. Um, and so it really does actually also do things like it, it affects the economy, it affects other disadvantaged areas. If you apply disability or race or sex on top of ageism, you are really amplifying uh, some very serious problems. And it is harmful. Uh, and it is about physical health, it's about mental health, it's about social well-being, um, and it does take a heavy toll on the economy. If more older people were in the Australian economy, we're talking about somewhere near $50 billion. And it's very interesting, because you go to the US and you can see older people who work in McDonald's. Like, no one in their 60s would work in McDonald's. I'm not saying it's a great job, but we devalue older people in Australia, I think, more than many many other cultures. And, and so we really need to dispel this myth. So that's why I'm here to talk about what the opportunities are. Um, but also there's, there's a whole pile of challenges we've got about health and ageing and, and what that means in terms of our health and wellbeing. And I want to touch uh, on... But also, um, we need to start to look at the financial elements of this. Um, we are actually right now, especially as a super zone, especially with uh, the share market the way it is, um, we are um, more than ever people who retire as soon as the 60s, 70s got a good pension. They had retirement funds that were actually cash and weren't tied to the stock market. Now we're seeing um, a new generation of uh, intergenerational. And also, I won't do it off, uh, much on this tonight, but also um, the aged care industry. Now, um, it's a little while ago, but everyone, uh, many of you would remember the Oakden scandal. Uh, and so, um, we really now need to start thinking about what's, what's a good aged care system? What is a good medical system? What is a good health system? Uh, and what sort of innovation can we have in this space to support people ageing in all sorts of different ways? Uh, it's also going to change housing. I'm going to touch on that. Where you live, So I wanted to touch on this notion of loneliness. Um, I've been doing this. Loneliness just kept coming up again and again and again. And if I can acknowledge, um, a lot of it is women uh, who are locked out uh, because they are healthier, they don't drink as much, they live longer, uh, probably like to smoke less, uh, and now and so suffering from loneliness. So we've created this um, urban system, this city system, where we all live in three-bedroom houses on the fringe of cities, and we're not connected to our community. big houses with big backyards, big front yards, we don't necessarily connect to our communities effectively. And so this um, starting to sort of broaden the scope of it's not just about popping a few pills and making sure you've got enough money for retirement. Um, it's also uh, about um, the digital inclusion, uh, which um, it's a bit of good news, 
Uh, digital inclusion is incredibly important, and um, it is actually the older uh, population profile who quite clearly, and it wouldn't surprise you, is, 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 is suffering and, and struggling with digital uh, literacy. Uh, and interestingly enough, the figures, for example, in COVID have seen dramatic increases in the age community in terms of online literacy, uh, purchasing things online, connecting with family, getting email addresses, etc. So there's a whole pile of work that needs to be done in that space, and I'll touch on that as well. Okay, now I am going to do a little bit of a party trick. I do notice that there's a form here you get to fill in with a score of 1 to 10 uh, about tonight's presentation. Now, if you really like the presentation, I'd love you to give me a 10. If you don't, my name is Martin Hazy. Anyway, moving on, I want to do a little bit of a party trick. So this is a thought exercise to help you understand the citizen of the future. So it might not make sense at straight away. Now I folded this piece of paper in half once, and it is now double the thickness of the piece of paper. Okay? If I use one hand, I've now folded the piece of paper in half twice. It's now four times the thickness. Okay? If I fold it in half three times, it's now eight times the thickness. Now, just out of interest, does anyone know, no matter how big a piece of paper is, what's the most number of times you can fold it in half? Does anyone know? Close, it's seven. So even Mythbusters have done it. Even if the piece of paper was as big as this room and you had industrial machinery, you can only fold any size piece of paper in half seven times. So if you want to get your grandkids to do the dishes, or you want your mates to buy you a beer at the pub, or you just want your husband to clean, do something, you can play that game with them to bet them that if they can fold a piece of paper in half eight times, they'll win. It's impossible. But we are going to think about what's possible, and we're going to stretch your minds tonight. So this is an exercise. If I could keep folding this piece of paper, it's going to be a certain thickness. Now, the exercise we're going to do is a thought exercise. So I'll get you all to stand up. You're lucky, actually, one of the, the tips I'm going to give you later on is squats. So you're lucky I'm not going to get you to do squats right now. Now, thought exercise. If I could fold this piece of paper in half 42 times, it's going to be a certain height. Could be five centimetres or ten centimetres. Do we have any engineers in the room? Good. Don't want a formula. I want a rough number, okay? Now, I'm going to start low, and when you think is the answer, grab a seat, and then keep going until we get to the absurd, and if you're still standing up, everyone's going to laugh at you, so you don't want to stay up too long, okay? Um, and uh, by all means, you can heckle, but I get heckled, I've been heckled by the, the best uh, it's called the South Australian media, uh, so um, that you know. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. So, firstly, sit down if you've seen me do this before. Now, this will be interesting. You'll see it from a different perspective tonight. So, that's all my always my way of just knowing who's actually seen me speak before. So, thanks for coming to the session the other day. Right. So, if I could fold this piece of paper in half forty-two times. Sit down if you think that pile of paper would be two centimetres. But you can't do it, it's a thought exercise. If I could do it, sit down if it's five centimetres. 10, 20 centimetres, a ruler, 30 centimetres. Let's go 50 centimetres, a metre. I did this at the Real Estate Institute like an auction the other day, it was much more uh, I was called cool to entertain you myself. I'm going to pretend I am two metres. It's as high as me. No? We've got five metres. Ten metres, twenty metres, thirty metres, fifty metres, a hundred metres, five hundred metres, kilometre. I'll go a mile just to humour some people in the room. Ten kilometres, twenty kilometres, thirty kilometres. So, how high is the pile of paper? About uh, 10,000 miles. Grab a seat. How high is the pile of paper? Grab a 
see how hard I'll pay back. $15,000. Not bad. The pile of paper would be from here to the moon. Okay? And for those who've seen it before, it's interesting, isn't it? Because you know the arts is like everyone just... That's, for those that said those thousands of kilometres and um, miles, give a round of applause. Now, why is this important and what is it relevant to ageing? Okay, it's called exponential growth. It's where things double every time you do things. If I said, have you not learned anything from COVID? You'd understand that small things become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And things change in an exponential growth. If I'd said 43 times, it would have been twice to the moon. If I'd said 44 times, it would have been four times to the moon. 45 times, I'm starting to get past Mars. 46 times, halfway through the solar system, 47 times we're outside the solar system. And so, you know, doubling the things to accelerate. And so you all thought we'd end up there in the future, but this is where you actually can end up in the future. Now, why is this relevant? Because there was a guy called Gordon Moore who created Moore's Law. Has anyone heard of Moore's Law? One person here. This guy has credit. He started a company you may have heard of called Intel. Okay? And he discovered that the number of transistors in computer chips was doubling, like the folded paper exercise, every 24 months in the 1970s. Okay? And he predicted that that would be the case for quite a long time. Fast forward to 2022, and it's the case today. It's getting faster and faster and faster. And so just as you think it's amazing to look at how technology has got us where we are, many of you, as senior citizens, would say things are getting thick, quicker and quicker and quicker and change is happening more quickly than ever before. Welcome to exponential growth. And so what we're now seeing is this accelerating growth in technology, which is fundamentally changing how our world works and the future in particular, to the point where the futurists and experts and technology experts are telling us that your phones are going to be cloud connected to a computer that is smarter than every single person in this room by the year 2035. Now, we're so worried about climate change or COVID or who's going to win the football, and we haven't even really even got our head around the fact that the world is about to see the biggest tipping point in terms of how we work, full stop. Um, and it's all about artificial intelligence. Um, and I'm not going to explore it too much today, other than say that AI won't be in the science fiction films. It's not going to just be in your Facebook, or it's not going to be used by our banks to predict. It's going to be in everything. It's going to be the common language of binary digits talking to each other through embedded devices in our entire ecosystem to fundamentally change how humanity works in our lifetime, in your lifetime. Lots of people would be saying, I'm not even going to be around in the year 2050. Who intends to be around in 12 years' time? Yeah, there you go. Um, and so what this did is give you an example of the, the steps that we're moving towards. At the moment, you know, historically we've collected a bit of data. Now it's about understanding and having hindsight of what's happened. Um, insight is when you start to identify patterns, but we're very much moving towards an era where we will be able to understand and predict the future in a way that we can't now through artificial intelligence. Oh, yeah, that's difficult. So the premise that I, I tend to talk on is that the future of cities isn't about the built form. I really hope that only road in the year 2050 looks a lot like it does today. Beautiful heritage buildings, embodied energy, great architecture, you never get that. It's gonna be the humans moving through the built form that are gonna have a new operating system and live in fundamentally different ways. And so um, uh, I talk about this notion of smart citizens and the truth is we are we had a conversation, John would have heard this many times, some of you would, smart cities. Now I'm not, I'm actually quite cynical uh, about smart cities because I think it's a, a brand, a product um, that is about selling widgets to uh, 
uh, company councils so that big corporations can run Sydney and control the environment. I'm passionate about smart cities. And I look around this room and I see a lot of smart citizens. Citizens who responded to this and registered to attend using their computer through Eventbrite, um, who um, might have used GPS uh, to get here tonight, um, who are you know, just out of interest, hands up, who doesn't have a smartphone on in the home? There you go. I haven't asked that question for ages. Um, and it's okay, it's not, I'm not a technological evangelist. I'm not here to tell you it's awesome. I'm here to tell you it's happening, whether you like it or not, and we need to understand it so that we can make more informed decisions before we hit that privacy okay until I have to solve uh, the, big, the big problem. But it's also not in our phones, it's on our streets, and we're starting to see technology embedded on our streets. Um, it's also starting to um, be embedded in our homes. Uh, and so we're seeing artificial intelligence in our homes. We can uh, just say, hey Google, and ask questions. And um, I actually ask Google, how long does it take you to drive here tonight? So I could get you off right on time. Uh, and, and so it's being embedded in all our smart home devices. Uh, but interestingly enough, it's now actually being embedded on our bodies as well. Uh, and I like, I love, I've, that's my watch. And, and I love the idea that that's called a watch because historically it used to tell the time. Now it watches your heartbeat, the number of steps you do. Soon it's going to watch your glucose. Um, it will watch, it will know, um, you know when you talk to people, it knows when you're meant to go, where you're going. We have GPS enabled. It, it connects, it's connected to the curvature of the earth. It is watching you and everything you do. Okay? But in, importantly, it's soon. It's actually the technology that's going to be inside our heads. Now, I'm a headphones fan, and I reckon in about 10 years' time, I may well have headphones surgically implanted in my head. They're called hearing aids. <laughs> okay? But interestingly enough, I know people who've got hearing aids who have got a Bluetooth device so that when their phone rings, they press the button, and the phone connects directly to the surgically implanted inside their head. Now, many of you would know by now the term of put phone on silent, uh, and I really hope that you control the notifications you get on your phone, because if you don't, I'm not going to be the only guy with voices in my head. Your phone is going, as an AI, is going to talk to directly to your brain. Technology is going to be inside your head, and when you use GPS, it says to turn left, says that John's around the corner having a coffee and he's got a little bit of time and there's some things he wants to talk about. He will tell me where he is and let me know when he's coming. And then I like a long black, um, etc. So the point is we are going to become, you can see it's a more intimate connection with technology than we did can yet even possibly imagine. And there's so many consequences to that. Um, and I like to, I'll just, I like to, I like to use this. This is another long now episode. This is my really long now example. I am now very going to quickly go into the history of civilization, okay? And so these squares represent people and how they move through the world, through physical space, a map. You're looking down on a map. The first one is Homo sapiens, hundreds of thousands of years ago. You know, the people that tried food, some of them made them stronger, some of them killed them, the men chased the women, and the women bit the men. That's how it worked. Now we have 10 million. Now we have you know, seven and a half billion people. That was hundreds of thousands of years ago. The next one is agriculture. That was thousands of years ago. And that's when people start to gather, work collectively, and, and start to actually share their resources, etc. Then you're talking about hundreds and hundreds of years, well, a thousand years ago, cities. Um, I very, do we have any urban planners in the room? Don, you want some? You're going to ask your planners tomorrow. Who was the first town planner? And not a single one of them will know. I've asked hundreds of urban planners, and they had no idea. And I'm the futurist. I'm not a historian. It was a guy called Hippodamus, first planner, Greek. Uh, they worked out how to do water, sewage. They created the first city. Hundreds of thousands of years, thousands of years, thousands of years. Notice this exponential one getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Next one is industrialization. London, they kind of worked out that it wasn't really healthy to have you know, animal feces in the streets. 
um, that smog was really bad, that they should put, they've got to move the workers to the factories and they've got to have the houses near there and like they've got to be to have good infrastructure and good roads and, and open space and a whole range of things. The modern city was born hundreds of years ago. Hundreds of thousands, thousands of thousands, hundreds. It's getting quicker, quicker, quicker. And then of course we get today. And we always kind of think that nothing ever changes, especially at the current Adelaide City Council. But um, things do change within context. And so that is tomorrow. The point I'm making with that folding paper exercise is that tomorrow is square about 35 years away. Now, interestingly enough, I just quickly want to go through um, a bit of a time travel exercise. I wanted to call myself an aspiring time traveler. I was told I'd never get any work if I did, so I just call myself a futurist. Um, and I just wanted to do some big time travel event called Doctor Who. It'd be great to see a woman, and, and many of you would have grown up with Doctor Who, I bet. Great to see a woman as Doctor Who. The new Doctor Who is a, uh, a, a black Englishman. I heard someone say as if Doctor Who was going to be black, and it's kind of like, are you kidding me? He's got an electronic screwdriver, travels time and space in a police box, and you give a crap about what color his skin is? Anyway, the point I wanted to make is I'm going to do a quick time traveling exercise. So, we live in that square there. If we went back to industrial days, looking around the room, I'll be honest, we would all be gods. You know why? Because you're above the age of the life expectancy by 20 to 40 years, you're alive. You've got nice teeth, you've all got hair, most of the people got hair. Yes, some of them have. Um, you can wear glasses, you've got shoes, you've got nice teeth, great skin. You know, you're alive. You wouldn't exist in that last square, okay? Go back to this, uh, the, another square, you're like, like, not gods, you're gods from outer space, okay? You really are. The point I wanted to make is that in the next 35 years, in that tomorrow square, if they come back to today, they'll be like gods to us. They will be so fundamentally different. The amount we learn in a week, people would take their entire life going to be the same in the next square. These people are going to be directly neurally connected to the world's history of information and the artificial intelligence for digital stuff. They're going to actually think completely different, like 20 years from now, completely differently to the way we think today. Now, the other element I want to make to this exercise, if you were homo sapiens, that was thousands of years, you lived in that box, you didn't go to the next if you were born in the era of agriculture, that was a thousand years. You pretty much just lived in that box. You might have gone to a city eventually. Now, if you're the city's box, you probably came from the country and lived and started the city experiment and, and became a part of the, the urban world. But you really didn't see that transition. And industrialization was a couple of hundred years. So I think there'd be one or two people. Please put up your hand. Who, who remembers seeing horses? wanted to acknowledge that. And you've seen, you've kind of transitioned from one box. We have transitioned from one box to another. The point is though, that every single human being alive today under the age of, you know, let's say 60, is all going to physically transition together to the next square. We are going to be the first human beings in the history of humanity to all fundamentally change from one epoch the next epoch in a way that's never been seen or imagined before. And so that's just really an exercise that I wanted to give you so that whilst we're touching this idea of technology now, in the next 20 years, it's going to become an intimate connection with how we fundamentally organize our lives. Even now we think of it, but we're talking an exponential change and getting to the point where these computers and these machines are smarter So, some trends. Jill was probably saying, what are you going to talk about Asia? Some trends. So I wanted to touch on some things that I think are incredibly important in terms of examples of how this technology is going to change our life. It's a really great uh, metaphor. There's so many things we could touch on. Um, and, and, and I want to touch on a few different things. Um, I love talking about drugs right now. I'm going to talk about drugs in a minute. Um, but one really good example is that the health and well-being industry 
is really starting to become personalised. Uh, and um, so this idea that you can monitor your, your, your risk, uh, on your risk, your heartbeat, your health and well-being, they are going to put glucose into it. It can tell you that you haven't done enough steps today. Um, so I, for example, have smart scales at home. I weigh myself, it gets uploaded to my phone. I have three, four years now of um, binge fast training, fast training, fast training. So I've you know, gone up and down. Um, and you can see my emotional state of well-being is directly connected to my weight, and I have measured it. I also have a wireless um, a blood sugar and glucose uh, measurement that I can measure my own in my own app. So when I go to the doctor, I can show my weight, how it's fluctuated, uh, my resting heart rate, uh, my VO2 max, how fit I am, a whole range of things. And so this is a really big part of the picture. Uh, and interestingly enough, I think this is very telling in the sense that this is news coverage as it relates to health technology. And Apple is the biggest investor in the world of health technology. And they're going to get their smartphone registered by the American um, medical industry to actually make it a legal medical device. Uh, my mum is in her mid 80s, she had a bad fall. She's now going to get an emergency button wristband to, uh, she has a fall so she can press a button. Um, but the challenge I would say is that Apple are about to put that in their, in their watches. So if you can embrace some of the technology a little bit more up front, um, you can actually start to use this technology. So it's a really good example of, of, of how it can actually protect, uh, protect your habits in your society. Um, also, smart health is not going to be just on your wrist. It's also going to be in the smart home. And, uh, and so we're starting to see the rise of the smart home uh, care market. And I've mentioned a couple of examples. Um, but now we're going from smart home to smart safety to smart wellness. Uh, but we're starting to see sensors in bed, um, monitoring the heart rate, um, uh, uh, telecom, uh, you know, scales, teleconnecting uh, to doctors. And so we're starting to see health and wellbeing absolutely with devices that you already even own, a phone, a potentially a watch, all being connected to each other and talking to each other to create a better, better profile. Another, uh, I'll tell that example a little bit later. Um, um, some other key trends that I think are really important in terms of the future uh, of, uh, of wellness and, and aging is that houses are going to change. And this is a really important one. So Australia is one of the biggest houses on the planet, um, but we're going to see uh, uh, bigger houses again as people start to sprawl and spread from uh, city to regional Australia as a base of COVID, but we're also going to see smaller houses. Here's an example. Hands up if you've got an empty bedroom in your house. Right. Now, interestingly enough, um, I'll get into that in a, in a moment. Um, um, it's about having the right housing for the right community, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, but also, uh, I'll leave that one. Um, it's also going to be about how we create healthy cities, and, and I wanted to talk about this, and very consciously about how we reduce loneliness, increase people doing steps. Um, the truth is, if you live in Unley, I live in Bowdoin now, or the city, uh, you do more steps, you live longer, you're a lot more likely to be a healthier, slimmer, more friends, you have more access to cultural social services, and so these sorts of decisions about how we build cities are incredibly important as well. This comes from the World uh, Economic Forum around the future of real estate. And so we as Australians have spent our entire life looking out of the car window. Now, I'm quite well known for sort of people that I'm anti-car, I'm not. Um, I have a really cool, fun car. Uh, but I believe in integrated transport. I believe in walkability. I'm a patron of bikes in South Australia. And so uh, I know, for example, that there's a lot of resistance in places like Unley to high density. And the truth is um, that we need those high densities because um, we don't have the housing choice. And we encourage people to live in low density, drive everywhere, um, with climate change, obesity, health and well-being, loneliness, there's a whole range of things. Housing choice, uh, and I think I've got this here. Um, who doesn't want to live in a 20 minute city? You can't live in that if you just want low density. Do you not want walkability, safe cycling, local public transport, affordable housing, like green spaces? And so we are going to see urban sperm change. It must. I think I put this slide up. I didn't put it up 
uh, about density. Um, but this is the sorts of uh, environments we're starting to see. Places being really highly by people, walkability, people wanting to spend time in public environments, more time, more money, better positive experiences, more connectivity to human beings, the list goes on. The truth is we have the lowest density of virtually any city on the face of the planet. If you oppose medium density, you are actually living in a South Africa apartheid because you're not encouraging diversity and choice. And as the population grows older and we have um, empty nesters and we have women who've lost their husbands, they don't need or should not live in two or even three bedroom or three or even two bedroom homes. And they don't have the opportunity to live in their local community if they don't have the housing choice, etc. And so this is the, the information I wanted to show you. This is this is really telling. This is the density of Adelaide. We're right down the bottom. Um, and these are cities like Dublin, Vancouver, um, Manchester, Helsinki, even Sydney. Sydney's nearly twice us. And, and so it's not about you know full-on density, but it's about housing choice and housing community diversity. Which one of your grandchildren or children can afford to buy a normal house anyway? So we, we need to provide those affordable housing options. And what that looks like it is about the fact that people tend to think of cities in terms of, I don't want high rise, I want to attach single family. There is something, and Unley is absolutely the, the sweet spot called the missing middle. It's about those other options there being medium density and meaning that people have access to medical services to, and they can walk to the post office, they can catch up with people in their main street communities, and, and it's about getting it right when you're in the right place. Um, and uh, this is a good example from Sweden uh, called Hammerby, Hammerby by the Sea. And I went there, and this is not high density, this is medium density, but you can get really good quality infrastructure, great open space, great services, uh, public transport uh, that runs readily, uh, high quality <coughs> urban amenity. And so this is something that I want to acknowledge that Hammerby has tackled. Uh, Prospect, I think, is doing a, a really, really good job as well. It's about the fact is that we've spent our the more you think, the more you do something, the more you think it must be right. And we've all grown up in low density, three bedrooms, attached houses, and we thought the car was the solution. And, and now we're starting to see a whole pile of things about climate change and obesity and loneliness, and, and etc. So we need to, to, to challenge our housing affordability. This is what I did accidentally when, um, when I was putting this on. This is Bowden Village. And so Bowdoin Village is a really great example of, of brownfield development and, and medium density and quality of life. You can't, when, when you get consulted on your council budget, you can't have everything you want and not take things away. You can't have great tra public transport or great open space or, or vibrant Main Street if you all want to live in really big houses with really big backyards. It doesn't work out. So that's the thing. Now, there's some other things that I really need to touch on because I acknowledge uh, I might go a little bit over time, but I don't think I'm going to get in trouble. Um, is the future of food, uh, and, and that's a big part of housing as well. Um, now, I've got to tell you, the future diet is exactly what we should be eating now, but we don't. And so uh, I wanted to sort of give you some ideas about what some of the other key things are, um, but we are facing some serious issues around how um, sh you know, issues like sugar tax, uh, for example, and, and, and how much alcohol we consume. I might touch on that a little bit later um, down the track. Um, meat is a really good example. So the future of ageing, you will probably not see red meat. You know, oh, I'm a red meat. Wow, it's $400 a kilo, and you can get something else, and I'll go into that. Um, and and meat, meat, if meat was a country, it would put out more greenhouse gases than every other country. If, if, if beef was a country, as a country with the deforestation, um, we actually only eat 3% of the kilojoules that are put into the meat we only get out of it. It is so inefficient, uh, and it takes a thousand litres of water to make one steak. Now, in the future, uh, when water wars are happening and water scarcity is happening, and we look back on the past and think they used to flush their shit with beautiful water, um, we will start to rethink about how we actually um, consume water, for example. Um, and so protein 
is going to be a completely different uh, thing. People are going to the lab, it's going to be artificial, um, and interestingly enough, it's also going to be insects. Now here's one for you. How many people in the, in the world eat insects regularly as a dietary component on the planet? Anyone want to have a guess? Millions? It's two billion people. So this is a good example where we go, oh, it's like a quarter of the planet already has this. We're going to see um, insect uh, protein powder. We're going to be eating insects now, which is going to be an incredibly cost-effective, healthy way of consuming our protein in the future. Uh, and also food is going to have fungi, bacteria, yeast, microalgae. There's going to be a whole range. And you're starting to see all these vegan products. You notice all these vegan products. It's a really good example of, of change happening before our very eyes. Another one that's really important is the share economy. Now, should every single person in a neighbourhood own a lawnmower? Or could we just have one and share it? Um, there's 100 million electric drills in the United States. I think it's 50, sorry. In the United States, have been used for less than five minutes. Do we need all of these things? And so, it's not the share economy isn't about um, it isn't about Uber or Airbnb. Although, for example, the, uh, the 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 older community are using Airbnb to tackle loneliness, uh, as retirement money, um, as keeping busy, about meeting people and enjoying being entrepreneurs, new entrepreneurs. Um, and, 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 and at the senior part of their life. Um, but importantly, it's not just about those things. Bendigo does a great example where they've created an entire ecosystem of shared economy. And this is about how you connect and create resilient communities so that people can grow and share vegetables. They can share their room, uh, their space in their house. They can actually you know, sell, their, you know, sell products in um, cottage industries. It's about how you connect communities and create you know, with the cost, cost of petrol and supply chain issue, why aren't we creating our own resilient local supply chain communities and using that share economy and technology to connect us uh, with people as well? Um, but also, there's things like the metaverse. Now, I'm running out of time. I'm not going to get to this. You might think it's irrelevant now, but I can tell you that there's some wonderful examples of where augmented reality is starting to change how we perceive the world. Merely you holding your phone up in a city for wayfinding to work out how to get places, to see things in your own home. Uh, and if you think that it's all a distant future, um, it was called Pokemon Go. <laughs> and you saw how much that transformed the use of cities literally overnight with technology, for example. Um, so, but also, there's going to be some fundamental changes in how we go about healthcare. Increasing patient centricity, prevention and wellness that I will touch on a little bit more. I've touched on urbanisation, the power of data, um, flexible organisation. We're going to see the health industry transform itself dramatically using this information, using artificial intelligence, using data, being able to crunch that information in a big way. Uh, this button's a little bit. Um, and of course, there's genetic engineering too which is about understanding our genes and programming things in and out. It used to happen over decades, now it's called CRISPR. CRISPR is a technology that is like Microsoft Word, cut and paste. They can literally do it instantaneously and there are some major issues, um, phil philosophical issues and ethical issues when it comes to things like that. Another one that I really wanted to touch on very, very quickly, because I love this idea, and I think cities are gonna do this in particular, is citizen gamification. Now, I don't talk about playing computer games. I'm talking about how you motivate and incentivize people to do things differently. And I always remember being on a, being in Greece and seeing a Greek man smoking a cigarette right under a no smoking sign. <laughs> Realistically, we have signs saying, do this, don't do that, can't you read the sign? It's a song, some of you will know that one. Um, but the truth is that we still complain that speeding fines is just revenue raising when it's not. You complain, all complain about car parking uh, fines when it's about turning over the car park and making places accessible. Hot tip, you don't want a parking fine, it's easy, I'll tell you. Just read the sign and follow the rules because you're not special. Okay? But the point is gamification is different. It's about incentivizing, it's about behaviour change. 
Um, and I get Qantas frequent flyer points for some of those steps I did. I get Qantas frequent flyer points for not looking at my phone for eight hours. Wellness, okay? There's a great example in Singapore. They have a telephone light box. This is a great wellness example. Telephone light box. They can wheel it in, put it at the front door of a high-rise apartment. You go in, you sit down, you put your arm in, does your blood pressure, it weighs you, and it gets a whole pile of health data around you. You do it once a week. It uploads to your mobile phone. If you've improved your data, you get a financial reward. That's gamification. If you've gone in the wrong direction, it gives you an electric shock. <laughs> no, it doesn't. But you can see the point I'm trying to make. It's about gamification, it's about incentivization. It's about how do we use technology to get people to do things differently? Because at the moment, you know, and local government is a good example, councillors, including myself, can talk to their blue in the face, but until such time, and a citizen actually gets out of bed and does something different, it all just fluff. Gamification is a really great way of changing citizen behaviour and thinking about how we can reward ourselves and encourage citizens to do things differently. And so it's that motivation. Um, this is the sort of data I get. I weigh myself, um, I get Qantas points, uh, etc. etc. So that's just all things that I know. So I know that the rise of the machine is really, really scary, okay? I also understand that globalization makes you feel like you have no ability to change the future. But I wanted to offer some tips and tricks just to finish off about how you can be the change in the world and how you can age with dignity. Um, and one thing that I've thought about this a lot in terms of the future citizen, and it's kind of a bit weird, the future citizen is actually about your best self as a human being. Goes back to being a caveman, doesn't matter what era you're in, you are still in a biological entity, and it's about being the best human you can possibly be within the context of all of this. And so I really am about encouraging people to be the change. And so uh, I'd encourage you to think about some of the things, and if you can only pick up one thing from tonight, that would be really, really lovely. Um, and, and so, a couple of concepts I wanted to, to talk about is that, you know, the, the polymath, the Leonardo da Vinci's at the time were special because they were smarter than everyone else. They read books, they had access to information and they were fascinating. You're all polymaths. You have the internet. Many of you in this room are retired and you have time on your hands. And so the best, uh, I lost 25 kilos about four years ago. The best thing I did to lose 25 kilos was sit on my ass for hours and read and learn and grow. So it's not for me to teach you, it's for me to encourage you to understand that there's lots to learn and empower you all to be polymaths and think about this as a hobby. I want to live for as long as I can. I'm going to pick up my iPad. I'm going to read. I'm going to learn how to use the internet. I'm going to get out there and get the information I want. And so um, one, of the, one of the, I guess, more spiritual things that I wanted to to sort of talk about is this notion of ikigai. Has anyone heard of ikigai? Yeah? So it's Japanese philosophy where ikigai is that point where you, you can actually combine what you love, what you're good at, what you get paid for if you do, or you volunteer, uh, and what your world actually needs. Vocation, mission, passion, profession, when it all comes together, I get to do that in the future. I still can't believe, still like a 15 year old kid, I can't believe I get paid to do this stuff. It's great fun. And so as a, someone who's potentially retired or moving into your old age, it's about finding that purple patch. If you're not enjoying your life, and if you're not in that space, as someone who's retired, can't really complain you're the only person. You don't need money to do these things. It's about choosing to be the person you want to be. It's not about being wealthy or rich. Um, and the other one too is I really encourage you to think about and have a plan. And I think this is important. Uh, it'd be great when, um, uh, when we get rid of uh, the, the fees associated, um, forgotten, the fees associated with buying and selling houses. What's it called when you're stamp duty? Stamp duty. Stamp duty. Because part of that plan is going to be where am I going to live in the future? You know, how am I going to live? Who am I going to live close to? What street am I going to be near? What access to public transport? Uh, what access to hospitals, social services? Where are my doctors going to live as well? So there's all of this stuff that I could cover that's really about understanding you want to live your best life 
can live, not only as long as you can, but get to the point, imagine a future where you can be healthy and strong and active brain and then one day you just don't wake up. Wouldn't that be better than, you know, degrading, being degraded over time as a, as a, as a body? Now, so in terms of the reading, I couldn't recommend this website higher up, Healthline. It is magnificent. I love it. You know, really encourage you to get on there. Start reading about things. Just understanding, you know, a whole range of things about what, what you can and can't do um, and inform yourself on a whole range of uh, particular issues. Now, very quickly, because I'm running out of time, some other things I wanted to touch on in terms of tips and tricks for living your best life. Drugs. I want to talk about drugs. It's not as surprising. Firstly, um, who knows what the half-life of caffeine is? <coughs> you consume that drug all, most of you, every single day, and we don't even inform ourselves on what we consume. A half-life, like uranium, takes a thousand years for it to go from half to half. Half-life of caffeine is eight, six hours. If you have four cups of coffee in a day, in six hours you've still got two coffees in you. In 12 hours you've got one coffee in you, and in 18 hours you've got half a coffee to get back to your body. Um, another one too, in terms of ageing with dignity, an assertive task nothing good about alcohol at all in any way whatsoever. You might say, oh, I like alcohol. Like, yeah, great. I like doing lots of things too, but it doesn't mean I'm going to you know, poison myself crazy over this stuff. And you need to make decisions. If you want to drink alcohol, you go for it. I'm not here to tell you. If you want to smoke cigarettes, that's great. Alcohol is the only drug in society that you've got to justify to people why you don't take it. That is not right by my standards. Okay? Um, so that's just one. Um, in terms of the other stuff, there's a whole pile of other things you can look at. Zinc, um, creatine is a really good example. Um, vitamin A, uh, vitamin B, vitamin C, vitamin E. Um, you know, multivitamins can be good, etc. Use Healthline. Find out. Discover these things. And I'm going to talk about hormones in a little while as well. And that's another one too. Another one too is I hate the term social distancing. It's crap. We need to be more connected than ever. It should have always been physical distancing. That's the term the World Health Organization used. We just missed that whole point. And so it's not about keeping, it might be about keeping some physical distance, but it's about that social connectivity. And so this is part of growing old. It's growing old by connecting with people, being a part of your community, being here tonight. You can walk up to any single person in this room you've never met after this event, and say, Stephen said I should introduce myself. You've now got permission to talk to strangers, and it's good for you. It's good for you, it's good for community to work together. I'm really hoping you can connect one or two ideas to your community and be more active in your community. There's at least one person who's going to run for council in the next council election. Maybe a few. Get involved. Not in Don's world. That would be terrible. Um, uh, but also living. So I've touched on this. Think about where you want to live in the future. Don't make the assumption you're going to live in a big house until you die. Do you really want to be doing the gardening at 85? Yes. You know, you know, if your house, if your three bedroom house is worth a million dollars and a two bedroom house is worth eight, 850,000, if there's no standards, what can you do with that 150,000 dollars to live a better life? No, grandkids could come. For 150 grand, you can take it to Europe four times. You know, it's about thinking outside the square, um, or in that sense, in the square. So, medium density housing, thinking about your house and lifestyle. Um, get, I would say, I wish I bought my mum a smartwatch. Get your head around some of this technology. You know, it's not a bad thing to know what your heartbeat is. And it's not a bad thing to know, oh, I've done 8,000 steps today, it might go to 8,250 tomorrow. <coughs> about knowing how many kilojoules you've done. Um, it, it's fun, and if you're retired and you've got time on your hands, what better way to get to know yourself and what you're capable of and push yourself in terms of actually being healthy and, and having some information that you can give your doctor. If you fall over, emergency button. It will know that you've fallen over and send a message. Um, so, you know, yes, we could, it's very scary, but at the end of the day, there are some great opportunities here as well. Um, the other one, too, in terms of technology is gaming. It's great for your game. Uh, great, great for your brain, you know? Who can use a PlayStation controller? Right, give it a go. Play with your grandkids. It will stimulate your brain. 
might be chess, might be reading, might be all sorts of different games. It might be just driving the kids crazy in front of your grandkids. That's a good game. But doing those things, there's a whole lot of evidence around when fit and activities and movements and, and things that are really good for you. Even VR headsets, you can now move and do different things. It's not a bad thing to add to dignity and grace. Um, the other one too is just work on being happy. Now I find this one funny because I know that these are oh, I'm not happy. You can't just be happy. You, know, you can't just tell me to be happy, Stephen. I'm not happy. Well, there are ways you can actually be happy. I, I've struggled. I've been surrounded by depression. Um, I, I understand that it's not always easy. But there is some science around this that you can deal with. I think, now many women would know a lot of this because they've gone through a whole lot of change. Many men would hopefully know it because they've gone through the changes with their partners. But I, I, I've learned a lot about hormones. I think this is going to be the next big trendy thing when it becomes to health and well-being, fitness, weight, uh, and, and mental health. I think it's going to be incredibly health, health and important. So understanding how you can get serotonin, understanding how you can get oxytocin, um, dopamine, endorphins, etc. You know, things like as simple as um, getting out in sunlight, um, hugs. I'm going to get away with it. Sex will make you live longer. It releases uh, things. Um, uh, yeah, I said having, having a dog, having a pet. Um, one I like um, that's really important is making conversation count. It actually releases hormones in your body and makes you healthier and happier. I'll say it again because I want that to be released in my body and your body so you feel better tonight. I want this conversation to count. And so understanding and Googling this stuff is really cool and yeah, really interesting. And testosterone. Men have seen a 25% decrease in testosterone across the face of the planet in the last 30 years. Not because of aging, it's because something's happening. And you wonder about obesity, cortisol, lowering the stress, a whole range of different elements there um, are really important. Understanding these things. You know, come on, guys, which would which one of you aren't going to Google how can I increase my testosterone? Um, and it's not about what you might think it is. Um, it's actually about these kind of things as well. I mentioned pets. It's a great way of, of actually being healthier, being happier. You know, we wouldn't go for a walk for ourselves, but we somehow want to take our bloody dogs for a walk. It's just it's mind, mind bending uh, kind of stuff. And actually eating the right food. So I, I've already got into this. Like I've, I've, I've clocked my computer. I have got my car performance tuned, but I like to clock my brain. It's fun. Um, eating the right foods. Fats. Understand fats are really good for you. Salmon, um, avocados, healthy fats are absolutely fantastic for your body. You know, um, and starting to read on these things and choosing the right. It's not about losing weight. It should never be about losing weight. It should be about increasing your brain, increasing your body strength. Um, and this is a good one, protein. As you age, you need more protein. You know, every single one of you could actually have the same muscle mass as a 30-year-old, except it's about understanding muscle synthesis. And everyone over the age, of, from about 40, you start losing muscle mass. Um, and so um, from the age of 50, you need 20% more protein than someone under the age of 50 to have the same muscle synthesis as someone younger. Um, and so for me, knowing my weight, that's about 120 grams of protein a day, three times. Who knows how much protein you're actually eating in a day? And the thing is, when we want to lose weight, good stuff, when we want to lose weight, we start eating salads. <laughs> and we actually, as you grow old, the number one thing you need to do is actually your skeleton, your bone density, your bone strength, and your muscle mass. And we don't. And we drink. We eat carbs. We, you know, we don't understand. Um, you know, we feel, feel eggs were bad for us because of cholesterol. The list just goes on. And so, understanding your sources of protein and how you can get them and when you get them, probably the biggest tip I think I could give you. Um, and then hand in hand with that is this uh, idea of intermittent fasting. Now, do some research on this, and I'm not going to be a dire evangelical or a Baptist. Um, but actually, autophagy is this process of cave people used to, to not eat all the time. They didn't have three meals a day plus snacks. And a 
glass of wine tonight. Um, maybe today sometimes you that is. And interestingly enough, you are a better hunter. A man is a better hunter when he is um, uh, in a fasting state, has ketosis, releases ketones, his brain works harder, he has more stamina, um, etc. Um, and so it's also called autophagy. They have now proved, and autophagy is a cell feed, they have now proved that you can help the cancer um, skin life longevity by sometimes two weeks fast, and your cells actually regenerate and they actually eat the bad cells um, because they need a source. Um, and so it, there is really, really, really good science around not eating three meals a day all the time. Yeah, it's work, I can't do it, it's all good, I can have some cheese after it. Um, and the other one too that I wanted to touch on is, um, look, I'm not a muscle man or a bodybuilder, but every single person in this room should be doing um, a resistance training like You should all be bodybuilders. Every person who wants to live longer and be healthier should be doing some sort of weight. Might not be relevant to you now, but when you're 85 or 90, you, like my mum, you can barely get to her bed to sit, to watch television all day and do nothing else and have a really bad fall. If you want to physically enjoy your life, you need to do some of this stuff. You need to do resistance training. It is just a, a must, a given. Uh, and also yoga. Yoga's a really good one. Stretching, movement, um, a whole range of things. There's some really basic movements. You don't have to go to a 45 minute class. Um, but if you're retired or you've got to spend time, realistically, what's going to hurt doing a little bit every day and, and getting, and, and it will also put serotonin, dopamine, um, make you healthier, make you happier, um, a whole range of, of things. Um, and the other one too is just quickly, the, the best one you can do is a squat. I won't get you to do it today, um, but you can't go wrong. Bit of resistance training, bit of yoga, get those squats in, it will change your life. I've only really started doing my squats And the other one too is go for a walk. Go for a walk in the sun. Take your partner, take your dog. You should be walking every single day. 50% of Australians do less, uh, over the age of 60, do less than two hours of exercise a week. And they're retired. I don't know. What the hell are these old people doing with their time? Bloody lazy buggers. But it's just, you know, a bit of sunshine in face. Once again, hormones. Um, and also, just in closing, I find it really interesting, the more information I read, the more I realise how much we've got to learn from the East, not the West, and how we've got to learn from the past, not the future. And the East has got, I spent a lot of time in Asia, the number of old people that do Tai Chi in public parks with their friends um, in a community setting, which kind of wraps up almost everything I've talked about, is really, really fascinating. Um, they respect their elders, they live with their elders, they support their elders, um, they use public space because they live in a high density environment, the elders have access to public transport, the list goes on. It's worth thinking about because we in the West don't know everything and this is all one big massive social experiment because it's only been happening for 50 to 150 years and we don't know what the consequences are. These, these, um, these communities have been operating for um, and, and the last one, a couple of points I wanted to make, I'm just going to go back to slide, is the other one I'd say is don't retire. Now, stop doing the job you're doing, but don't think of it as retirement. Don't think of it as giving up. Think of it as a next phase. Think about doing something differently. Have a plan. Doing a retirement and I'm retired is kind of like saying I'm doing it. Maybe you do lots of things. You've got so much knowledge you can share with the next generation volunteer, you, you know, you can walk more, you can do your yoga. Don't think of it as work and then retirement. Think of it as a transition into a next and more enjoyable stage in your life. And the last kind of element too there is also think like an entrepreneur. Um, you know, interestingly enough, the most successful entrepreneurs in the United States are over the age of 60. You know, we think of young rock, uh, entrepreneurs being rock stars who wear jeans and use electric scooters and, you know, stuff like that. Um, the non collective knowledge and wisdom in this room must not be underestimated. Um, but also, thinking entrepreneurial is get yourself a mentor. Get yourself a young person as a mentor. 
mentor them as well. Hand on your knowledge. Create the value of your wisdom and your experience. We should all be mentoring somebody, and we should all be being mentored by someone as well. And finally, stop aging now. It's just like um, it's just like the Me Too movement. It's just like gender issues. You know, I've been a white man from Ribbon Ambassador. I do not tolerate the way that men have traditionally treated women. I'm not going to get into patriarchy right now. I will, uh, uh, I will upset people. But this is no different. Apartheid is gone. Gender is on the, issue, on the agenda. Stop aging now. If people say derogatory things about you or your friends or you're thinking derogatory things about you or your friends, you need to either call it or you're a part of the problem yourself. On that basis, I hope that's been useful. I really want to thank you, Sydney Money, for it and a very kind introduction. Thank you very much to Jill. I hope you've got something out of it. Thank you.